I don't go down a fear-mongering rabbit hole very often. It's not my nature, but when it comes to the gut, and when it comes to gut inflammation, I get a little bit irritated, no pun intended. I really do look at this stuff and say, these might be things we should limit based on the research. Possibly even go so far as saying, eliminate. So I'm gonna list the specific foods, but know that I'm focusing on foods that are high in polysorbate or contain polysorbate, potentially contain carrageen, and that one's still out for debate a little bit more. Things like mono and diglycerides, these can be problematic. And then we'll talk a little bit about lecithins and if that's something you should be concerned with. So before we get started, I put a link down below for Element Electrolytes. That is a link for a free sample variety pack with any purchase. I'm a big fan of their more sparkling versions, like the ready to drink cans. It's just straight up electrolytes. I'm not having to worry about taking in calories. Sip on that throughout the day and it curbs my appetite. So that link is down below, gets you that free sample variety pack with any purchase. Okay, the first food category we need to talk about. We're gonna talk specifically, I'm gonna call out some brands that I've seen personally have polysorbates and some other compounds in it. So craft salad dressings, those are the ones that I have seen a lot of polysorbate on. So if you look at the back of the, you know, the ingredient label, you're gonna see it. Now, the reason that they're gonna be in salad dressings is because these are emulsifiers. They combine oil and water to make them stable and make them not have to separate, right? So also Hidden Valley Ranch, unfortunately, because that stuff does taste kind of good. But there's a lot of other ranch options that you could make or you could find. See, I'm not telling you not to eat your salad dressing. I'm not telling you not to eat ranch. I could tell you to limit that in other videos for caloric reasons, but I'm just saying, be careful with this stuff because its whole idea is to emulsify. And if it potentially is causing damage in your gut, I can give you the research. Do you want some of the research? But I had an entirely different video breaking that down. We have seen since 2018 consistent research and in laboratory settings that polysorbate 60, 20, 80, these are used literally in laboratory settings to break down the gut barrier. They break down not just the mucosal layer, but the gut barrier. They also increase the production of gram-negative bacteria producing toxic lipopolysaccharides that then get through the blood. Point is, just take my word for it. I can link out to other videos so I don't go on forever on this one. Interestingly enough, Doritos nacho cheese flavor specifically is the one that I could find. Okay, this has polysorbate in it. Why is that? We'll get to that in a second. Also, the Lay's barbecue. The reason that's with specific flavors is because polysorbate is also used to even the flavor out. So because it makes it so certain flavorings won't clump into one particular area of the chip, but there's other ways that they could do this. We know other ways in food science where you don't have to use polysorbate. Polysorbate is a synthetic emulsifier and people will get on their high horse and say, well, it's made from sorbitol and fatty acids. Just because it's made from two things that exist in nature doesn't make it healthy. So what they do is they take sorbitol and then they also take fatty acids and they use a chemical solvent and it makes a surfactant, okay? And this ultimately acts as an emulsifier. So they've chemically adulterated these things. It's a similar discussion that you have with a lot of seed oils like canola oil. It's like, sure, it's oil, it's a polyunsaturated fat. I could explain from a fatty acid profile and carbon chain and all this, how it's okay, but it's the fact that it's treated with hexane and all these solvents and deodorizers that makes it truly problematic in my opinion. It's not the actual oil itself. So anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent. So they even the flavor out. Okay, so now we've got Kraft salad dressings, we've got the Hidden Valley Ranch, we have the Lay's barbecue, we have the nacho cheese Doritos, then we have the Hostess Twinkies and the cupcakes. I am hoping that you're not eating these to begin with, okay? But they're used to improve the dough elasticity. So they're used to just make it softer and have a better. So all these things food scientists have looked at and said, okay, this is how we can make a food be more palatable where people eat more. And then you have the Little Debbie's, the Swiss rolls. I used to eat those like crazy when I was overweight. Actually, before I was overweight too, I used to eat them way too much, right? Those were terrible. And also the uh, little cupcakes that they have. These are problematic. We wanna be careful with these kinds of things. Now let's move over to ice creams, because this is a big one. A lot of ice creams are gonna have polysorbate. This is going to be a very popular one. So you're looking at like Mayfield brand for sure, Publix, Kroger, these brands, without doubt, they have polysorbate in them. Some dryers flavors do, some do not. You really have to do your own due diligence here. This is a food it's not worth taking in. Is it one of those where you say, oh, well, I just have it every now and then? That's a tough one to answer because damaging the gut could be really problematic. In fact, from the microbiome perspective, it's really gnarly. There was a study in Microbiome 2021. I'm just gonna read you an excerpt from the study. In accordance with previous studies, both carboxymethylcellulose and polysorbate induced a lasting and seemingly detrimental impact on microbiota composition. But let me read you another study from scientific reports that talks about the mucosal layer. 
Check this out. Acute exposure to emulsifiers impacts barrier and structural properties of intestinal mucus, which may contribute to the development of intestinal inflammation. And this was early on, back in 2018, when we were first looking at the issues with polysorbate. Do I have a bone to pick with polysorbate? Yeah, I do. I do. And if people want to like flame me and destroy me for this and say that I'm fear-mongering, if this, this is one that I'll take it. Fine. I'm fear-mongering. But if my fear-mongering helps you not eat something that I think truly shouldn't be in our food supply, I'll gladly take the heat. Call me wrong, call me whatever. It doesn't make sense when you know people in the scientific realm, literally in the lab that are using this stuff to make a cell burst. <laughs> Why would we consume that for the love of all things good? Now, the last one that's kind of interesting is the gums, like chewing gums. Okay. Now, fortunately, most of the gums have moved to other things. Okay, they've moved to uh, just different kinds of emulsifiers, even glycerol, okay? But there is one particular one, and it's the trident layers gum, which is interesting. And it's because the little gummy layer they have in the middle has polysorbate in it. So that might not be one you wanna be chewing and have a continuous supply going down. Most of the other gums are getting okay now. But you do have to look for ones that also contain like mono and diglycerides because these are next on sort of the chopping block. You know, people were realizing polysorbate is probably not good, so they were moving to some of these other ones. So the mono and diglycerides are going to be a little bit better. We are still seeing evidence of microbiome disruption, but we see that with all kinds of things. And if you're chewing a sugar-free chewing gum, you're probably getting an artificial sweetener anyway, which is potentially nefarious for your microbiome anyway, but it's still out in the open and people are, you know, it's a net, what is it? Like, do you want to actually chew the gum and not eat? So you lose calories or don't eat calories. I mean, you get where I'm going with it. Is the artificial sweetener worth it or not? But when it comes down to the emulsifiers, this is more than just the microbiome. So we see microbiome evidence with mono and diglycerides, but we're starting to see early evidence of gut barrier issues too. So I think those are ones we wanna move away from. Most of the gums, fortunately, are using soy lecithin or sunflower lecithin. I might even get destroyed by my own community for saying this. I'm not a big fan of soy, but soy lecithin is so far removed from the actual soy and the estrogenic components of soy in the first place, I wouldn't worry about that. Same with sunflower lecithin. It's probably one of the safer emulsifiers you can use. So I'm pleased to see that most of the sugar-free gums are using those emulsifiers now. Which leads me to the point. If you see sunflower lecithin or lecithin in general, that's a good thing more than these other emulsifiers. So don't freak out over that. Now, what about carrageenan? I can't speak to carrageenan too much because the evidence from a gut barrier integrity standpoint is not good. Like we have seen some negative evidence there, but we also see so many different categories of carrageenans, like polygenins and all these, like which ones are really bad. I think carrageenan is one that you can have in small amounts because it's not chemically adulterated as much as say a polysorbate is. It's still coming from red seaweed and adulterated to a certain degree, but it's more so concentrated versus like a polysorbate, which is actually made synthetic to a certain degree. So as always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.